chamber support, Prince William support for helping to make this facility possible. I think mean, he's just now sitting down. I like to call this building the House of Sam Bill. Uh, <laughs> Sam Bill was the, the real fault leader at this, and now Steve Parsons, who's our Vice President of Workforce. And just to give you a quick idea of what this Workforce Center has allowed us to do in terms of the acceleration of what we're doing in terms of workforce programs at NOVA, I thought I'd just give you a little insight. Um, NOVA very well may be now the largest program or fastest growing, largest and fastest growing cybersecurity program. We have approximately now 1,400 students, which grew from 50 just three years ago. And so there may be some that are bigger or faster growing, but uh, they'll have to prove it to me first. But this facility plays a big part in that. We don't do most of our degree programs here. This is our non-degree, but we have our George Washington partnership here. So when our students finish here, they can then go straight into George Washington and finish a four-year degree, but they just really walk up here and take courses here and finish. And so, uh, plus two, we have some of our year up staff that works with us in that partnership. So those partnerships play a key role in what is uh, emerged as one of the fastest growing cybersecurity programs in the country. Uh, another area, uh, we've been pleased to be able to uh, implement the new workforce credentials grant for Virginia, uh, and NOVA's leading the way on that. I, we're about 40% ahead of every other college in Virginia, and having this facility makes all the difference in the world. That's, this is where much of that training for those 11 different certifications that we now have and adding to that list, plus our certification center is on the second floor. So just like you can walk from community college to a four-year degree, here you can walk from workforce training up to the certification all in one place. And so this facility makes that possible. And then just some of the new things that are happening here. Just uh, two weeks ago, we had a graduation of our first uh, Uncommon Coders program, which is our coding boot camp specifically for veterans. And so a uh, three month coding boot camp uh, that really is, if you talk to them, boot camp, uh, because they, are, they were here from eight in the morning until a lot of times 10 o'clock at night, five nights a week uh, to become Java coding specialist. And now they're moving out into the workforce. So we're excited about that program. And very soon uh, across the hall in that same room, we'll start a, a new program that uh, we'll ask your help on if you can help us identify some folks. We're working very closely uh, with Amazon these days, and Amazon, we're going to be providing the apprenticeship training for Amazon, which will take place in this facility. And so Amazon specifically looking to hire veterans that have four-year degrees and an A-plus certification. And so uh, if those folks are out there, then they're looking to hire them and then put them through the apprenticeship program that we'll be providing the training for in this facility while they're hired and working at Amazon. So. If you know veterans who are transitioning out or out there, been in the workplace, if they have a four-year college degree, they don't have A-plus, we can help them get the A-plus certification here through the Workforce Credentials Grant, but uh, Amazon is looking to hire them through their AWS program. So we're excited about that and working with our partners in Amazon. So all of those areas are things that we've been able to do and to accelerate uh, over the last uh, year and a half since this facility came online. And so I just wanted to thank you for uh, your support of this great facility, which is regional for Northern Virginia, but obviously where it's located and, and the support of Prince William. So that's why we're always glad when you're able to use it and to come here, because while it's the Regional Workforce Center, it is your center, and we want you to feel at home here and this is your place every time you come. And we want to also note that we're thankful for your support of NOVA and helping us to do what we're doing today. So thank you very much. And, in that regard, I'm now going to step aside and after welcoming you and, and CC Barthol, he's going to take over from here. It's an exciting program. Thank you for being here. What a wonderful facility, and thank you for uh, hosting us today. All right. Well, Mr. Brendan, where is he? <laughs> All right, we, uh, I'm going to start off, I want to welcome everyone out uh, today. What a beautiful day, and it's supposed to get cold here this weekend, but summer is on its way. I would like to introduce our VIPs uh, in the room today. I know for sure that we have uh, the, um, the Honorable, Honorable Ruth Anderson from the Occupy District Supervisor. There's any others that I'm 
there and I, I'm getting the, no worries. But we do, I'm looking around this room and I see a lot of VIPs in here. So. <laughs> uh, I would like to recognize, do we have any of our past chairs in the room? Please raise your hand. Oh, awesome. Let's give them a round. And I would like to recognize our host partners. Uh, we are pleased and honored to have a number of our fellow chamber, chambers as host partners here today. I invite you to stand and be recognized as we call your name. Please hold your applause to the end. Uh, we'll start with uh, Arlington Chamber of Commerce, and they are represented by Diana Waller uh, from Chasing Dragons. Fauquier Chamber of Commerce, represented by Guy Hinkler, Insperity, and Joel Barkman, Golden Rule, Golden Rule Builders. I was told I was supposed to meet you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> someone said that to me last night. All right. Uh, from the Fort Flory Small Business Center, Incorporated, represented by Linda Decker, President and CEO. Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce, represented by Kathleen McDermott and Craig Blakely, Alliance Law Group. Right. Mount Vernon Lee Chamber of Commerce, represented by Scott Stroll III, Chamber President and Executive Director at Gunston Hall, and Christopher Reddit, Chamber Treasurer, Vice President at the National Capital Bank. Let Give, oh, let me keep going. Sorry. That's <laughs> okay if you feel inclined. Uh, Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce, represented by Kevin McNulty, Director, Government Relations, Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. All right. Let's give all of them a round of applause for being here. I would like to recognize our president and CEO of the Prince William Chamber, Debbie Jones. Thank you. And I would like to recognize all of our current board members. I know we have a few. If you could raise your hands. All right. Let's give them a round of applause. And I will. I want to read off our vision partners. Uh, if you could, we will hold our applause to the end. All right. Starting with Didlake Incorporated, they are connecting people with disabilities to business and their communities. They are our economic development partner. Dominion Virginia Power, it all starts here. They are our education partner, and we'll hear more from them, from them in a moment. Transurban, giving travelers new choices for faster travel in Northern Virginia whew, <laughs> through the 95 and 495 express lanes, and they are our advocacy partner. Ziders Enterprises Incorporated, a quality of life company providing individual and family support mission expertise to military, veteran, and federal customers. And they are our quality of life partner. Let's give all of them a round of applause. At this time, I would like to recognize our presenting sponsor. Please help me welcome Deborah Johnson, State and Local Affairs from Dominion, Virginia Power to the podium. you haven't heard, we are now doing energy. <laughs> uh, so we just made that change. Uh, now that confirmed by our board of directors last week. So uh, many of you, so we're, we're always pleased to be a, a sponsor and to support the chamber in any way that we can. We believe in and are committed to chambers throughout the throughout the Commonwealth and beyond through all of our service area. Uh, just very just very briefly, you know, you all know us in Virginia as your electric provider. Uh, we're the ones, I try to talk about outages, but we're the ones that restore your power. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, the, I'd say probably the most challenging uh, part of our company is when we need to cite electric transmission lines. So we all have read a lot about that. Uh, but we are committed to serving every customer and to meeting the reliability needs in our, in our area. So it's tough sometimes, but uh, we are very committed. We are very committed to doing that. Uh, about 15 years ago, Dominion uh, made a change and we acquired a, a gas company and that has become very much uh, a part of our footprint. 
Uh, we operate in 14 states. Uh, um, electric providers, gas providers, uh, nuclear stations in other states, in, as well as in Virginia. A big part of our operations are our natural gas operations, and so we thought we would take today to tell you a little bit about that. So I'm going to ask to the stage Carla Picard, who's one of our external affairs managers, who uh, is focusing now on our natural gas operations. Thanks, Carla. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you to you all for the time on the agenda this afternoon. Thank you to the Prince William Chamber for a delicious lunch. <laughs> I still have chocolate covered strawberries on my uh, plate, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. Um, but I did want to take a few minutes to uh, kind of talk a little bit about um, the gas side of our business at Dominion Energy. And uh, of course, anybody that's paying any attention to the headlines uh, lately knows that the Clean Power Plan is a little bit up in the air, so to speak. Uh, but I wanted to offer a few, few comments on how that doesn't change Dominion's commitment to clean energy. I have a couple of statistics, so forgive me for referring to my tiny little device here. Uh, since 2000, Dominion Energy has closed, sold, or converted 12 of our coal-fired units at power stations. The company has reduced its carbon emissions rate across our generation fleet by 40%. And this is a trend that we're seeing all across the country. Uh, in the U.S., 2016 marked the lowest carbon emissions since 1992. So we're seeing a steady decline in carbon emissions across the country. Um, and Dominion's carbon emissions rate is among the lowest in our industry. And that's part, uh, in part because of our company's six nuclear units, our growing fleet of highly efficient natural gas-fired power stations, and a growing portfolio of renewable energy. These significant improvements in efficiency in air quality wouldn't be possible without projects like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and Eastern Market Access. Uh, the Eastern Market Access Project, uh, you might have a, a blue flyer on your table or in your chair to give you more information about that project here in Northern Virginia. Also, during just the past two years, Dominion's investment in Virginia solar projects is approaching $1 billion. Uh, these are projects that are either in service, under construction, or currently proposed. Just this week, Virginia's Governor McAuliffe uh, push the DEQ to tighten carbon regulations for power stations. Dominion Energy feels that our continued transition to lower and zero carbon emitting sources will best position the company to meet this and any future carbon requirements while maintaining our commitment to delivering safe, reliable, affordable, and increasingly clean energy to our customers. So again, I want to thank you for uh, your time. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and uh, Dominion has a number of folks here in the room. If you have any questions that we can answer as your clean energy partner. <laughs> so as your sponsor today, and one of your sponsors today, we also have the privilege of introducing our Speakers. So the first speaker that we're going to hear from today is uh, Stephen Moray, who is the president and CEO of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. And they start walking this way. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie keeps telling us, okay, move things along, move things along. Uh, Stephen Moray came to the Virginia Economic Development Partnership at the start of 2017, having previously served in the same position at the Louisiana State University Foundation. There, his work was praised by Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal and helping to boost the state's economy and worldwide outreach. Moraine previously served as Secretary of Louisiana Economic Development uh, Partnership, uh, President and CEO of the Baton Rouge Area Chamber of Commerce, and an associate at McKinsey and Company. He also worked as Public Policy Fellow at the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana and Assistant Chancellor at LSU. Today, he joins us to outline his plan to grow Virginia's economy faster, spread the wealth beyond Northern Virginia. Okay, we accept that. 
if we do, we want everyone to be doing well and return the Commonwealth to its former glory as the top place to do business. So I'm not sure if I was supposed to say Louisiana or Louisiana, you can help me with that. We're glad to have you here. very much and it's, it's really a special privilege for me to be back in Prince William County, one of the great localities of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, I've just finished recently my first 100 days, I guess now actually 125 days, I suppose, as the CEO of the Virginia County Development Partnership. Uh, I, my wife and I are not from Virginia, but we have many ties to Virginia. I was telling uh, President Rawls, for example, uh, my younger brother got his start uh, right here at Northern Virginia Community College and he went on to get uh, two engineering degrees at Virginia Tech. Uh, my mother's lived in Virginia for almost a quarter century, um, most of that in Northern Virginia more recently in, in Richmond. My wife and I lived in Arlington early in our marriage and uh, we vacationed in Virginia many times. So while we, we don't have the kind of roots here that many of you have, it's really a, a special privilege for us to be back in Virginia uh, and to be a part of efforts to advance the Virginia economy. So what I'd like to share with you today is uh, a, few, a few thoughts about uh, BDP and the future of the, the Virginia economy. Uh, I'll share some initial sort of outsider impressions, if you will, uh, of Virginia. Talk about uh, our sort of five modest aspirational goals that we have for the Commonwealth and for BDP. Uh, and then talk a little bit about where, where we're going from here. So let, let's start with initial impressions of, uh, of Virginia. Uh, as you well know, uh, Virginia, the Commonwealth is considered, has long been considered one of the best states for business in America, uh, but we've actually fallen uh, quite dramatically uh, in the national business climate rankings since 2008. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, we have incredible uh, human capital, infrastructure assets, geographic assets. This is probably, I think, after having visited every region of Virginia, possibly the most beautiful state uh, in America. I'm just blown away by the natural beauty of this place. Uh, our population growth has really been dominated by Northern Virginia. Uh, Northern Virginia is about a third of the population of Virginia, but about two thirds of the population growth the last few years. And almost half of the 133 counties and independent cities in Virginia have actually lost population uh, the last five years. So it's not just a question of which parts of Virginia are leading our growth. We literally have uh, two or three regions in the urban crescent that are really driving the growth and much of Virginia is actually uh, declining uh, at the same time, not just growing more slowly. Uh, incredible port and airport infrastructure. It's hard to overstate uh, the value of, of Dulles, of the Port of Virginia, of, of Reagan and so forth. Uh, and obviously the federal government drives a tremendous amount of our economy, but uh, to the good and to the bad, if you will, and we're so tied to that. Uh, it's been a big part of our, our growth has slowed down uh, the last few years and something we've got to kind of diversify against over time. And lastly, as you look at where Virginia is at today, really ever since federal sequestration, our growth has slowed down, uh, and we're currently forecast to grow roughly at or even slightly below uh, the southern average. So we have a lot of great assets, but we also have uh, some challenges to address uh, at the same time. I want to share with you today uh, five aspirations that I have for BDP. Uh, initially, I characterized these as tentative aspirations before we had an opportunity to really visit with business leaders and economic development folks across Virginia. But now, having visited every corner of Virginia, uh, there was not a single person statewide that, that was not uh, positive about these as, as valuable goals uh, for us to seek. I'll, I'll mention them briefly and we'll talk about them in more detail. First of all, going back to the growth, positioning Virginia to be one of the employment growth leaders in the South and the country. Second, uh, ensuring that every region of Virginia participates in the growth of Virginia. I'm not suggesting, I think Northern Virginia will likely be the primary growth leader for Virginia for the foreseeable future, but we want to ensure that every region is at least in positive territory, not uh, uh, shrinking at the same time we're growing up here. Uh, third, we want to get our national rankings back to the top. Uh, we've got a very special partnership with the Virginia Chamber of Commerce I'll talk about there. Uh, we want to get BDP itself back to being the premier state economic development organization in the country. We're going to have to do that. We've got to accomplish all these other big goals. And finally, we want to put the P back in, in BDP partnership. Uh, when you think about everything that we're trying to achieve for the Commonwealth of Virginia, we are actually a very small organization relative to the aspirations that we have. And our success is really going to depend to a great extent on how well we collaborate with and partner with our local partners, our regional and state partners, our higher education institutions, the Port of Virginia, the Rural Center, the Virginia Chamber, and others across Virginia to help position Virginia to grow. So other than those five things, I don't have any big goals for Virginia, but those are <laughs> going to take a little work uh, to get done. Let me talk a little bit about the growth. I talked about 
that first pool uh, achieving faster employment growth. Um, and again, this is largely related to feral sequestration, uh, this sort of slowdown. But right now, we're really forecast to grow really right at uh, the southern uh, median. In fact, if we had included Texas, I think we'd actually be slightly below the average if we looked at it, uh, that one. The difference between growing at the median and, and once again being one of the employment growth leaders would be uh, an additional at least 20 to 25,000 jobs per year over and above our baseline growth expectation. <clears throat> so a lot of what keeps me up at night is thinking about what would it take to, to help cultivate an additional 25,000 jobs per year in the Virginia economy over and above that baseline. That could be a combination of more growth from our existing companies than we expect, as well as new companies coming into Virginia. But think about what that would mean for the Commonwealth of Virginia if we were to achieve that. It would mean more economic opportunity across Virginia, more sales, literally billions of dollars in more sales for small businesses like chamber members like many of you here today, consistent population and migration. The last few years, we've actually had net out migration from a domestic uh, perspective, uh, better retention and traction of college graduates, lower poverty rates, uh, and, and not insignificantly more tax revenues with which to fund all the things that we'd like to invest more in, like infrastructure and higher education uh, and teacher salaries. So the difference between 1% growth, is, think of 1% growth and employment growth as uh, you know, thoroughly average, 2% growth is exceptional. That 1% that delta makes a huge difference to the future of Virginia over time. We want to get as close to 2% statewide as we possibly can, and certainly faster than that here in, in Northern Virginia. Secondly, uh, shared growth. Um, again, when you look at the last five years in Virginia, in fact, we could probably look over a much longer period of time, uh, it's not just that the, the, the urban crescent has been driving the growth of Virginia, it's that uh, we've had roughly half of Virginia that's actually in decline, We're literally losing population uh, in an absolute sense. I just got back from uh, deep, uh, far southwest Virginia, where they're projected to lose a thousand people per year for the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, one of the studies we're going to be working on this year, uh, hopefully with Virginia Tech and with uh, VCU, uh, is a study to analyze the cost of rural decline uh, to the rest of Virginia. If you sit here in Northern Virginia, you may think, hey, you know, metro areas are winning. We, we really shouldn't worry about this issue of rural decline in Virginia. But I think that I think that we should. And the reason why is that if you think about what is it that actually happens if these regions like Southwest, like Southside, continue declining, it means we're going to see higher Medicaid enrollments, which largely you're going to pay for up here in Northern Virginia. It means more incarceration. It means more drug-related challenges. Uh, there are a whole host of issues of additional costs uh, that would be borne by the rest of Virginia if those regions continue to decline. So what I'm seeking to do and this is going to be a, a big focus of ours, is, is to uh, develop a, uh, a rural development agenda for Virginia that would position uh, every region of Virginia to grow. Not every county, but every region of Virginia to grow. And I think the impact would be transformational, not just for those regions, but for Northern Virginia uh, as well. Um, third, rankings. Remember, it wasn't that long ago um, that uh, Virginia was, was regularly viewed as America's top state for business. In fact, you, you may remember some of those headlines that were out there. If you were to go to our website today, it literally says Virginia, top state for business, right at the top. Uh, but it's been quite some time since any of the national business climate rankings put us in the number one position, or the number two position, or the number three position, or the number four position. Uh, in fact, we have declined uh, actually uh, across the board. Uh, here, just looking at uh, five of the top uh, rankings that are out there, you can see we've declined steadily. In 2009, we were literally in the number one position in most of the major business climate rankings. Since then, we've fallen about seven spots on average. Um, there are actually nine uh, general business climate rankings of states. We're only in the top ten in five of those. We're literally outside the top ten uh, in four of the nine uh, business climate rankings. You can see uh, some of the uh, some of the, those are listed up here. But literally every ranking that we can find, uh, Virginia has declined. Uh, so why have we declined? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Every ranking has its own methodology. And look, we can acknowledge right up front, all these rankings have their own shortcomings. You know, none of them are perfect. Uh, but they do have an impact. They have an impact on the way that people think about states. They have an impact on states that are considered for, uh, for projects, for leads, and so forth. They, they have an impact on, on how we view, but they also reflect competitiveness issues. There are three big reasons that uh, Virginia fell uh, since 2009. Uh, the first is business costs. Not so much that the business costs increased, but there were a number of new rankings that came out 
that better reflected uh, the actual tax burden uh, that we experience here in Virginia versus other places around the country. Uh, the best example of this is the Tax Foundation's uh, Location Matter study, it first came out in 2012. One of the things that that study shows is that for a new capital intensive manufacturing project, one of the types of projects we really would like to attract more of in Virginia, uh, we have almost the highest state and local tax burden uh, uh, rate in, in America, uh, the second highest in America for that type of project. So that while we're overall uh, relatively competitive in our tax structure in Virginia, uh, particularly for new investments, we're one of the few states in America that for every type of industry sector, we, we face a much higher um, tax burden for new investment in Virginia than we do for all the existing industry sectors that are there. That ranking got included in Forbes and CNBC and site selection and Carina and in every case it causes us to go down. Uh, second, economic climate and growth. Uh, a big portion of these rankings like Forbes and CNBC uh, is driven by um, basically the growth of the economy, growth of employment, growth in GDP and so forth. Uh, with the federal sequestration, not only do we slow down our, our actual numbers the last few years, but our forecasts also uh, are much lower. That caused a, a pretty substantial decline. And then finally, uh, the perception of CEOs uh, of Virginia nationally uh, declined. We don't rank poorly by any means, but we went from being, you know, typically in the top five, say number three or four or so among uh, C, uh, uh, surveys of executives to, you know, more of a kind of uh, eight to 13 or so uh, range. In fact, most recently, uh, in fact, it was either this week or last week, we dropped to literally number 15 uh, in, the, in the, the chief executive, the CEO uh, ranking of, of best and worst states for business, number 15 in the country. And by the way, this is not based on some methodology. It's literally asking the CEOs in corporate America to rank the states. And we came out 15th in a straight ranking of the CEOs in corporate America. There are a number of reasons for that. Part of it is that uh, Virginia is a quiet state. We don't really tell our story. We're very proud of what we have here. We have a lot of wonderful assets. Uh, but we literally spend uh, approximately zero uh, marketing the Commonwealth of Virginia compared to you know, tens of millions in Michigan and, or New York or around eight to ten million or so for Ohio and Florida and many other states that we compete with. So uh, we clearly have uh, some work to do. I'm really excited to share and uh, my great friend Barry Duvall, who's speaking next, will talk about this a little bit more. But we're uh, building a partnership with the Virginia Chamber of Commerce to take Virginia back to number one. Uh, in the business climate rankings over the next few years. We've got a great uh, team working on this, with both their staff, our staff, and some of their board members, some of our joint board members. Um, there are three big focus areas that we're gonna have to get us back to the top. The first is policy improvements, addressing some of the tax and regulatory issues that are holding us back. Uh, second, programmatic initiatives. Uh, for example, we have some of the best higher education institutions in the country, but our customized uh, workforce development programs for new and expanding companies are not uh, ranked even in the top 10. Uh, that's a gap that we have to close. Uh, and finally, uh, marketing and branding uh, Virginia. We don't need to be one of the states that spends the most on this, uh, but you know, it's hard to, we could debate exactly what the right number to invest is, but zero is probably not the right number. Uh, so we're gonna be working uh, with the legislature on this. So over the next few months, um, Barry Duvall and our teams are going to be partnering together to build basically a portfolio of initiatives in these three categories that will ultimately go to the Virginia Chamber Board uh, and then the things that they approve will go uh, to the General Assembly and we're hopeful that uh, they will adopt much of that and we'll be able to get back on top uh, over the next few years. So this is going to be a very ambitious effort, but I think a very exciting one also. <clears throat> um, the fourth thing we want to do is get BDP itself back on top. When BDP was first created, uh, it was really a, a even today, it's, it's, a, it's probably the single best model in the country. I'm not saying that we're not, it's not executed the best in the country right now, but the basic structure of it was really visionary when it was set up in the mid to late 90s. The first 10 years or so of its existence, it was really arguably the premier state economic development organization in the country, certainly one of the better ones today. But um, in many cases, what's happened is that either we've declined a little bit in how well we were doing things, but also other states really dramatically ramped up their efforts in custom workforce solutions and how they handle incentives and what they do in marketing and so forth, lead generation, site consultant cultivation. Um, we are now, uh, we're better than average, but we're not, you know, we're not nearly where we want to be. We are uh, doing um, a, uh, uh, an assessment right now of each of the functional areas of EDP compared to the top uh, peers in the country, and we're going to lay out publicly 
what it would take to close the gap and how we're going to get us back to the top. And I think if we, for successfulness, I think we will be, it'll help us achieve all the other things that I've been talking about uh, so far. And then finally, uh, one, of the, one of the many visionary aspects of how this organization was first established is literally the name of the organization, because it really reflects the reality of what economic development is, and that's a partnership, a Virginia Economic Development Partnership. We want to make partnership uh, the single most uh, important or common descriptor of how people talk about BDP and the work that we do. Collaboration, alignment, partnership, uh, working well uh, with our partners. And that includes certainly first and foremost our local uh, and regional economic development partners, but also uh, some of the other important groups that are out there, the General Assembly. I think there was frustration about the level of connection there. Our work with the governor, the Port of Virginia, the airports, a higher education institution, and many other um, entities out there that are important to the economic development of Virginia. We want to do a better job of cultivating our alignment with those groups. So those are the those are five modest goals uh, that we're working on <laughs> over the next few years. Um, a few examples of things that are coming up. Um, you may have heard about a pretty damning JLARC report back in November. We're spending a lot of our time this year addressing uh, those issues. Uh, I mentioned we're going to be building really an exceptional marketing and, and branding effort. We're going to be laying out uh, a plan for new division of incentives to more tightly manage uh, those incentive programs. It's very important to the, 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 the taxpayers that are out there. We're going to be finalizing a proposal to launch a world-class turnkey customized uh, workforce recruitment and training incentive uh, similar to uh, Georgia Quick Start program or the Louisiana Fast Start program that I helped create. Those are the top two such programs uh, in the country based on all the rankings that are out there. Uh, we're going to be ramping up our efforts with site development and trying to make sure that we've always got sites uh, ready. And finally, I mentioned the, the rural development uh, initiative. There are many other pieces to this, but those are several of the important things that we're taking on. Uh, many of you are aware of BDP, I'm sorry, of Go Virginia, and wondering about how does Go Virginia relate to BDP. Well, I would tell you, one of the things that actually attracted me to Virginia uh, was the, the presence of Go Virginia and the recognition that um, successful economic development certainly includes marketing and business recruitment, but it doesn't end at that. We've also got to focus on uh, workforce development initiatives, site development, higher education programs, encouraging regional collaboration. Uh, and so I see it as a very constructive effort. I've spent a lot of time with uh, WN, the leader of that group, talking about ways to work together. Uh, if you think about it, BDP is sort of principally a uh, marketing and business recruitment organization. Uh, Go Virginia largely kind of a product development organization, so there's sort of complementary focuses there. Um, we are collaborating on several things, most importantly, some of our economic development um, strategic planning uh, for the future. So for example, we just decided, uh, it's not final, but pretty final, that uh, we are going to be collaborating on an economic growth strategy for Virginia and each of the regions of Virginia that will leverage both uh, our uh, business development insight with the regional councils and the economic growth and diversification plans that Go Virginia uh, is doing for each region. Uh, specifically, uh, one of the things we're partnering on is a target industry uh, economic development strategy and action plan for Virginia for each of its regions. This will be not just the target sectors, but what are the, uh, the specific product development initiatives and business development initiatives that are needed to enable us to be one of the fastest employment growing states in the country and enable every region of Virginia to participate uh, meaningfully in the growth of Virginia. Uh, we've just selected in the last 24 hours an incredible team. I don't think we've finalized negotiating the uh, contracts. I can't tell you who it is yet, but they've got a lot of Virginia connections as well as incredible global experience. This is going to be a very big, uh, robust planning effort over the next few months. We expect to finish by October. One of the things this project is going to do is take the best ideas that come out of those Go the regional councils and incorporate that uh, into the plan. Uh, and finally, uh, this year we're developing uh, a strategic plan for the future of EDP itself. This will be uh, heavily influenced by input from our local, regional, uh, and statewide stakeholders. Uh, we've got a great steering committee that will be guiding this effort, uh, made up of some of the top uh, economic development leaders in Virginia, but the local and regional level. Uh, Barry Duvall himself will be serving on that, as will uh, representatives of the Port of Virginia, the leader of the rural center, and many of our local and regional groups. We're also engaging, um, I think, a very impressive uh, expert panel that includes some of the top um, economic development thinkers in Virginia and around the country. Uh, folks like Jeff Finkel, who leads the International Economic Development Council, uh, Ken Poole with the Center for Regional Economic Competitiveness, uh, Enrico Moretti at UC Berkeley, who wrote uh, The New Geography of Jobs, one of the top thinkers in America on regional economic development, uh, Steve Fuller uh, here in Northern Virginia, uh, Chip Filer at ODU, 
Uh, we also have someone at Brookings that we're hoping will join us as well. He's a leader uh, in regional economic development thinking. So I hope you can see that not only do I have a lot of optimism for the future of Virginia, we are taking uh, very deliberate action to position the Commonwealth for a brighter economic future and a future that I know that Prince William County uh, will be a big part of. So thank you all very much. I wonder if we have time for questions. Or where's Jane? <laughs> yes, we have time for a couple questions. Any, any questions or thoughts for that matter? Please. There's this uh, no man's land between Northern Virginia and the Richmond uh, Charlottesville area. Yes. And it, uh, a lot of people are feeling that you know instead of making a lot of investments in road and rail, you know, maybe investments should be in infrastructure broadband, mm -hmm. sewer, water, power, four-story office building. Is a thought like that on the table or anything like that? Yeah, well, first of all, I think, um, I don't have the answer to this, so I probably shouldn't say it, but we really ought to have ubiquitous broadband in Virginia. I'm just absolutely convinced that that needs to be part of our future. The faster we can get there, the, the, the better off you know, we're going to be in terms of economic development. Um, we are definitely going to try to balance our work for sort of the more dense areas and some of the less developed areas like what you're talking about. <clears throat> the, the thing we have to recognize as we think about that is that the, the big metropolitan areas like the D.C. metro area, including Northern Virginia, are just extremely advantaged for a variety of reasons with where the economy is going globally right now. So we want to make sure we get as much out of this region as we possibly can. Having said that, to your point, you've got you know, high cost issues, you've got limited spaces to go and so forth. So um, we do want to have a balance of tax. I don't know if I've answered your question directly, but we're going to be thinking about what are the best opportunities to grow each region, largely based on the leadership and the ideas that are generated locally in each region. There's going to be a new governor's uh, administration coming in. How do you view the role of BDP in one of your administration? Well, one of the great things about the way this organization is set up is it's intended to be, if not explicitly stated, it's implicit that it's intended to be a professional, nonpartisan uh, group that carries on over administration. So um, one of the things that's built in the state law and it's certainly incumbent on us to do a good job is that we make sure that we're being very responsive to whoever the governor is at the time. Um, in the Virginia Code, there's a requirement that each new governor create uh, their own economic development plan for Virginia, and then we're supposed to basically uh, adjust our plan to be responsive to that. What we're hoping to do this year with the governor's race this year is between the, the work that we're doing on this economic growth strategy and the Go Virginia work and similar efforts uh, in, with higher education research and also the Port of Virginia, is to lay out what the biggest economic growth opportunities would be to really make it easy, if you will, to have fully uh, developed and fully vetted ideas that we can hand to the new governor uh, and the General Assembly to, to look at implementing. So that's kind of the policy side of it. Uh, and then from a business development perspective, in any state, generally speaking, the governor is the best single salesperson for the state. So we hope that whoever is elected will want that to be an active part of how they spend their time. Uh, we'll make sure we're, we're responsive to how they want to use that. But uh, we would love to, and certainly Governor McCullough, whatever you may think of his politics, has been an incredible salesman for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Truly, I can't imagine uh, a more effective uh, salesman in that role. And I worked with a great one who was on the other end of the political spectrum uh, uh, in Louisiana. But whoever is elected, uh, we want to help them achieve what they're setting up to be for economic development, and we want to be a great advisor to them to give them some ideas about how to move the Commonwealth forward. I think there's a question. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, looking forward to the next legislative session. Is there anything in your mind that you would like to see the legislature take on as a top priority to help you fulfill your role as a PDP? Well, uh, not to tee up uh, Barry Duvall, but I think I think what's going to happen is uh, as, as part of the work that we do over the next few months on how to get our business climate rankings back to the top. It appears so far that a lot of the things that would help us the most relative to economic development are also things that would make a big difference in our business climate ranking. So, you know, we're not quite there yet. I would say it's very clear that um, having a few, I'm not suggesting a, a, a comprehensive tax reform, but I think a, a few targeted things 
uh, changes to make us more attractive for new investment, particularly for areas that we're not really attracting a lot of right now, like capital intensive manufacturers, really not getting a lot of that. I mean, a lot of our capital investments really more in data centers have been great. We're much more competitive from a tax position there than we are in manufacturers. Uh, having uh, funding available for marketing and branding Virginia, I think is very important. Uh, being able to launch a first class uh, customized workforce recruitment and training incentive akin to some of the leaders in the country, I think that's very important. Ultimately, the things we're talking about financially are not really big dollars. Uh, a lot of it is just changing the way that we do business, but there are some investments that would be required. I think what's going to happen, maybe this is Pollyanna of me to say this, but based on the conversations we've had so far, I think there's going to be some alignment between the economic development community, the business community, through the Virginia Chamber, uh, the Port of Virginia, Go Virginia, and some of the other groups that are involved in economic development. You're going to see us, I think, agreeing on a lot of the biggest priorities, which, as you know from past experience with the General Assembly, will make it a lot easier for them uh, to be able to support those things, knowing that not only have we fully vetted them from a substantive perspective, but hopefully we've got broad support among uh, the local and regional constituents as well. Thank you all very much. Great to be here. So that was just fantastic. <laughs> So, but uh, really, Stephen, you know, it, you talked about being relatively new to Virginia in this role and in some of your history and uh, associations and so forth. But I'm telling you, uh, just listening to you, I just felt very much your commitment to the work. You got up to speed like amazingly well, and uh, and then also compassion. And I think all of those things will be needed. And uh, we know that uh, all of us here. Uh, uh, your chambers, in addition to the Virginia Chamber of Commerce, are very committed to supporting uh, to supporting your work for the comic. So next, we have uh, the honor of hearing from uh, Barry Duvall, who is the uh, president and CEO of the Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, under Barry's leadership, the Virginia Chamber has grown to become Virginia's largest business advocacy group, with more than twenty six thousand members today. In 2013, the Chamber engaged more than 7,000 business leaders to produce Blueprint Virginia, the Commonwealth's first comprehensive business-led initiative to provide direction and long-term economic development planning for Virginia. As you know, we're here today to talk about updating that plan. Before taking the position of President and CEO uh, with the Virginia Chamber in 2010, Barry served as Mayor of Newport News from 1990 to 1996 and in several high-profile economic development roles, including Secretary of Commerce and Trade for Virginia from 1998 to 2002. And referring back to Stephen's discussion about supporting all parts of Virginia, I think Barry is driving from Roanoke today. <laughs> We're glad you're here. We look forward to hearing your comments. <laughs> There's a lot of miles between Roanoke, Virginia and here. Thanks for having Debbie. Stephen, good to see you. Thanks for your partnership. Scott, great to see you. Thanks for hosting this great event. And thank you all for being here. Thanks for your interest in the future of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And thank you for being a part of shaping the future of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm not sure if it was said before I arrived, but I would love for you to pull out your cell phones. Most speakers don't want that, but I want you all to pull out your cell phones. And uh, there should be uh, instructions on your table to download an app. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to uh, play a video to talk about what Virginia is going to look like in 2025 and um, ask you then to participate in a poll. And you'll see the results live on the screen. And uh, we will give you instant feedback as to what you think about the issues facing Virginia and what your goals are. So you can pull out your cell phone and download that app. And I'm going to skip through a couple of um, Preliminary comments about the Chamber of Commerce at the state level. We are a nonpartisan business advocacy organization. We're very active in the legislative arena in Richmond as well as in Washington. 
Um, our vision is to be the voice of Virginia business statewide. Uh, your local chamber is clearly your voice of business locally and regionally, and we partner with your local chamber, and we're the voice statewide. I uh, have grown the state chamber membership with the support of our local chambers to over 26,000 members. We're the largest membership organization in the state. We're the largest advocacy organization in the state. And uh, we partner with our local chambers to be your voice in Richmond and in Washington. Our goal is to ensure that Virginia is known as the best state in which to do business. I believe we're the best state in which to do business. I think we have some work to do to return to that from national rankings, and we'll partner with Stephen Murray uh, in Virginia Economic Development Partnership to do that. If you want to know where we are now, we have an online dashboard at our website that you can look at. It, it compares uh, Virginia's performance to other states and local peer groups. Uh, we are tracking the national rankings, as uh, you know. Many of those we have fallen out of the top one or two, and there are reasons for that that we're addressing. And our state, compared to the nation's growth, has been slower. In fact, this next slide, just by color, will tell you the dark shades are where most of the growth is happening year over year. This came out last week. Uh, Virginia grew from 2014 to 20, uh, 2015 to 2016 less than 1% in terms of gross domestic product for our commonwealth. So we have some work to do uh, to improve our growth and economic competitiveness, and we're about the business of doing that. Over a five-year period, you'll see on our dashboard how Virginia compares to other states in the nation. In this case, uh, we've grown um, about 6% compared to about 9.4% of job growth for the nation. Now, you all have a little brighter story to tell in this part of the commonwealth. You know, it is interesting as having the opportunity to serve the entire region, uh, the entire Commonwealth, to go into different regions. And we see regional differences. And we ask, do we think the economy is moving in the right direction in the Commonwealth? And that varies different depending on what part of the Commonwealth you're in. One of the reasons I shared the regional slide is because I've learned through my career in economic development and business that you as business people actually do business in economic boundaries, not political boundaries. So growth and prosperity occurs along economic boundaries, and those are regions in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's why we support that Go Virginia legislation, because it'll help drive regional economic strategy and grow regions together. And in this case, you look at the uh, growth, it's pretty impressive in the last five years from these counties that are listed here. How do we continue to move Virginia forward and grow jobs? I think it starts with the power of ideas. And the power of ideas shapes public policy. And in order to shape public policy, you have to have a strong business community. Uh, we were recently ranked the most influential association in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we work with local chambers to enjoy that reputation. We bring people to Richmond during the General Assembly and have Chamber Day at the Capitol to express our voice. During our reception, it's the largest reception uh, during the General Assembly with over uh, over 80% of the members of the General Assembly attending and about uh, 500 people attend. We track the bills in the General Assembly and we work with your legislative uh, representatives there from the local chamber. And we ask the members of the General Assembly to vote for pro-business bills and against anti-business bills. And we give them an easy thumbs up or thumbs down uh, methodology to follow. How did we do in 2017? Well, we tracked over 500 bills. We have a very competent public policy team uh, Ryan Dunn, our Vice President of Government Affairs, will be coming up here shortly as part of that team. And we uh, took formal positions on 89 bills, and we had about a 94% success rate in this last General Assembly session. I won't spend the time to go through the individual bills, but I will tell you education and workforce continues to be our top priority. And aligning the business community with the K-12 community, aligning the business community with the community college, and aligning the needs with higher education is among our top priorities. We also advocated for the restoration of Go Virginia funding and for regulatory reform. And we defeated bills that don't make headlines, but would, they would further increase the cost of doing business in Virginia. Last week at our legislative uh, annual dinner at our board of directors uh, annual meeting, we issued our legislative report card. Um, I see Linda Decker is here. Linda's on our board, and they have other board members here, but I'm just glancing around the audience. 
We have great representation from the Commonwealth business community throughout the state. We issue this legislative report card. Every member of the General Assembly is graded. If they vote 90% or better, they get an A. So we have a 10-point scale. Some people suggested a 7, but I, I like the 10-point scale when I was going through school. So 90% uh, or better is an A, 80% B and C and, and so forth. You can go online and look at our website and see how members of the General Assembly uh, voted and to actually see their grades. We do have a little, uh, just a group picture here of members of the General Assembly who attended, who received awards uh, for us for their individual initiatives. Um, and we, uh, we had a good turnout of about 32 General Assembly members that received awards. You heard about Blueprint Virginia in my introduction. I'll just recap what that is if you aren't familiar with it. Uh, during the year of governors elected, the state chamber goes around the Commonwealth and we actually have a bottoms up approach where we ask people like you who attend meetings. We held over 30 meetings last time. We had over 7,000 participants. Tell us what they think Virginia should look like eight years from now and what your priorities are to help shape public policy in the Commonwealth. We put that together in an executive summary called Blueprint Virginia, and we presented it to Governor Terry McCullough two weeks after he was elected. Now, I don't know about when you go in the governor's office, but when I go in for an appointment, he always has the blueprint right there on the coffee table. <laughs> so for those of you who have been in his office and it's not there, I'd like you to let me know, because he knows <laughs> that that blueprint is always on his coffee table, because it's there when I go in. Anyway, this is actually um, it was the governor. Uh, I would have taken it if it had been my wife thought, I'll tell you. Um, but so we're updating Blueprint. That's why we're here today. We're here to hear from you. And uh, it's a long term voice, it's an economic development plan, and again, it's nonpartisan. I like to say that we're involved in the campaign of ideas, not the campaign of people. We at the State Chamber endorse ideas and not candidates because I believe ideas have power and ideas turn into public policy. How have we done since we adopted our first blueprint? Uh, 375 pro-business bills have passed, 144 anti-business bills were defeated, and we've had an independent economist look at the impact. It's been very positive, about $10 billion in the Virginia economy since we adopted blueprint. So what's next for us is to engage in a long-term plan, long-term thinking over eight years and ask what Virginia is going to look like in 2025. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors for supporting this initiative. As you heard, we're traveling all over the state. This is about the fourth region I've been in this week. And uh, I just appreciate our local chamber partners and multiple chambers that are represented here of putting this event together and for allowing us the opportunity to be here because we want to hear from you. We have been all over the state. In regional meetings, these are some photos I think we have of some of the places, we, places we've been. This is places we've been and places we're going, and sometimes it's easier in Virginia to look at it geographically mm -hmm. and see where we've been and where we're going. So if you're a candidate for governor and some uh, organization has gone through the process of campaigning and, and listening all over the state, we're going to provide these updates and your results on a regional basis and a statewide basis from your voting today. We're going to provide those to the candidates this summer. They're going to hear the top line recommendations this summer. And then the final victorious candidate for governor will present the blueprint to uh, in December of, of this year. So what's Virginia going to look like in 2025? The future is racing forward. Who is leading the effort to secure Virginia's future? Who has the plan to keep Virginia heading in the right direction? To create good jobs, to ensure economic growth, to improve our quality of life. The Virginia Chamber Foundation is leading the charge to write the next chapter of our story with Blueprint Virginia 2025. Blueprint Virginia brings together diverse voices of business and community leaders across the Commonwealth to develop a focused plan to improve our economy. As we consider Virginia's future, are we creating enough quality private sector jobs to meet tomorrow's demands? Will our best and brightest remain in Virginia or pack up and leave? Will we make the changes needed to train our workforce for tomorrow's jobs? Attract capital and entrepreneurs, 
and lead the world in innovation and prosperity? Will we create an environment that encourages growth and reduces stifling regulations? So every community and every Virginian has a chance to realize their full potential. Have we done all we can? By 2025, Virginia's population will add over 1 million new residents. We will need a workforce to fill 800,000 new jobs, in addition to the 1 million jobs vacated by a retiring workforce. Demand on Virginia's ports will increase 41%, handling more than 2 million containers annually. Are we prepared for this growth? Are our schools ready? Are our workers trained with the right skills? Do we have enough energy capacity? and the right infrastructure to support vibrant and sustainable communities. Will your business and community be ready to compete and win in the changing global innovation economy? Virginia is a great place to live, to work, to learn, to innovate, to play, and to connect to global markets. But disruptions in global competition mean the future is uncertain. What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Blueprint Virginia is your opportunity to work together to strengthen your community, your business, and your future. If you are ready to put the long term ahead of the short term, then we are ready for you. Join us in securing Virginia's future. Now it's your time, your turn to participate. Um, JD is going to come up and turn this into a polling technology, and you'll see the results live. And I've asked Ryan Dunn, our Vice President of Government Affairs, to join me. He's going to lead you through the polling results uh, activity, and you'll see the results on the screen. I'll come back and close us in about uh, 10 minutes. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. All right. Everybody bring out their number two pencil, their PI-82. <laughs> <Test time. laughs> Um, now we're, this is this is a group activity. It's fun. Uh, it's also serious for us to get the information from you. But I hope you take the time to um, talk amongst yourselves, lobby your neighbor, uh, express your interest in why you think uh, one answer is better than the other, and uh, and have a little fun discussion. Throw out some ideas as we go along. If you uh, feel the need, uh, this is again not a time to be quiet. It's not test taking. It's not the SAT. So. Um, Starting off with this first question here to just get you a little familiar with the program and also uh, to see how many of you are lying. Um, we do not have that many 18 to 24 year olds in this room. So, uh, But now go ahead and just, this is the, the time for you to just get familiar. Also us understanding who's taking the poll as we go back and look at the cross tab. All right, we're gonna move along. Everybody got that in? Let's go. All right. All right, this is our Seinfeld-esque question. Again, trying to get you just familiar with the program. When eating a burger and fries, do you eat your fries before your burger, your fries with your burger, or your fries after your burger? This is an ongoing debate in our office. And there is clearly a right answer in this. Um, and B is coming in uh, across the finish line first, it looks like. Uh, it's just one of those Seinfeld-esque, you know, do you eat your Snickers with a uh, knife and fork? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this is a real brain teaser, where are you? Which of these best describes location, which most of your employees are located? Again, for us to find the regional uh, differences and similarities, this is just a uh, formality question. Now we're going to get into the actual meat and potatoes of the survey. Agree or disagree, Virginia's economy is headed in the right direction. We've had a few stops already in Northern Virginia and some other spots, and, uh, and we've been into Southwest and Southside, and this is one of those questions that varies greatly depending on your geographical location in the state. Uh, almost mirror images of one another. 60-40, uh, 70-30, uh, things are going well in some parts of the state in the urban crescent. Outside of that, it's uh, almost exactly flip-flop. So, and there we are, about the same, same percentage. Rank these in order of importance to Virginia's business climate. 
If you're not participating on the app, this is the only one you will not be able to participate in. But if you are using the app, the three lines over to the right is where you hold and click and move your rankings, putting the most important at the top and uh, least important at the bottom. And then don't forget, this is the only answer you must hit submit uh, for your responses to be recorded. Again, I give you a little extra time on these rankings as they have quite a few options. All are important, but again, a lot of this process of blueprint uh, is to get a priority over the next eight years. And this, uh, we're about halfway through the process, so we are starting to have enough numbers to kind of see trend lines, at least to some degree of things that are going to come in um, at the top. And having looked at how this response is, it is uh, pretty reflective over how the entire rest of the Commonwealth is looking. It's interesting that healthcare four years ago would have been a much higher priority, um, and now is has actually moved moved a little bit further down. Okay. Agree or disagree, Virginia is preparing the workforce that businesses need. All right. Rank in order of importance the skills critical to developing our future workforce. Again, all of these are critical. Soft skills probably would not have been there if we had done this polling 10 to 12 years ago, uh, but is now something we hear from employers that, that is quite uh, problematic or is becoming an issue more and more. So it is on the list. Uh, again, don't forget to hit submit after you have made your rankings. Okay, anybody? I don't hear much lobbying of your neighbor. <laughs> anybody? Feel free to speak up, offer your thoughts. Uh, there is an opportunity for you to put your, uh, uh, the next step in the process is going to our website, offering feedback to some of these. A lot of these are just for us to get you thinking about some of these big pop line issues. And then we ask you to go to the website and really office, offer us your thoughts, your concerns, um, ideas that you may have, that's really where we're going to get a lot of the, uh, the quality information for this. I'll plug that a couple more times, so if you didn't write it down more. Um, choosing just one, if you were a member of the General Assembly, you did all the work necessary to become elected, and you were given this tough task of putting all of your investment into one of these to meet Virginia's talent supply, and Virginia, which of these would you do? Choosing just one. Again, all are important, all have their place. This is about us getting a priority um, over the next four and eight years. As we sit in the community college, I'm not sure there are some happy folks in the room. Um, but that is actually the, also the, by far the way, the number one answer. K-12 and community college together have been getting about 80% of the vote. So, which is about where we are uh, right here. And uh, for your higher education, this is actually, I would say, the highest percentage that, ha that has come in anywhere in the state. Um, on average, it's coming in at about 5%. Um, people are not feeling like higher education is meeting the needs of where the workforce needs are. Um, so that is, while we're also, you know, finding our focus, we're also, uh, you know, finding some places where uh, we can improve. So uh, that has been a unique finding. <laughs> Choosing just one, what is the biggest obstacle preventing a young person from entering a skilled trade as a career path? Social stigma is on here. That has been a conversation at our board level for a long time. Um, this includes not just the social stigma upon the student, um, to not choose it, but that is a social stigma 
of a guidance counselor and of parents um, not wanting their child to go into that type of career. Um, so that really society as a whole. Okay. Yes or no, with better access to non-traditional public education, such as virtual or charter schools, improve education and help close the workforce skills gap. It's a relatively new issue being talked about from the business community in Virginia, um, but I can assure you in other states, it has not been a new item of discussion. The business community has been very involved in it for, um, for a long time. So just trying to get an understanding of where the business community feels here. Okay. Choosing one, which of these industries will drive growth in your region? This is futuristic looking. Um, where do you think or where do you hope um, there will be industry driving growth in your region? where it's really been unique to look at the different regions of Virginia. You've got a Lynchburg and a Danville separated by four and a half hours of drive and in very different uh, places in this Commonwealth that if you line these up and lay them over top of each other, they have the exact same vision for where they want to see themselves um, in the next eight years, which is um, really a good thing when we, when we come away from this with priorities, but we're also going to have hopefully some unique regional uh, focus so we can employ both Lynchburg and Danville on the same, uh, same issues, which would be uh, nice. So. Agree or disagree, Virginia's legal climate is a significant consideration in a business's decision on whether to locate or to expand here. Moving on, staying in that same field of the legal climate, agree or disagree, frivolous lawsuits have increased the cost of running your business, or just lawsuits. They don't have to be frivolous sometimes, it could just be a hassle. Okay, moving on. Choosing just one, how would you characterize the environment for startup companies in Virginia? Okay. Agree or disagree, Virginia should start moving forward now with comprehensive tax reform to make us more economically competitive. This one's not a brain teaser. There's no trick question to it. It is exactly how it reads. Um, sometimes we are trying to get um, focus and also to bring attention to an issue that I think sometimes we as a Chamber of Commerce and other folks, business community, um, People expect us to say that tax code needs fixing or we need to address taxes. And at the end of the day, a lot of people don't believe it. It becomes a mantra of the Chamber of Commerce to just say taxes, taxes, taxes. Well, after this polling, I can, I can actually go to a legislator and say, look, it is businesses that are out there and we've done our work. We now have a scientific enough uh, data to show you uh, that businesses are saying it is impacting me. We must look at it. We've got to be more competitive. North Carolina gets about a lot of bad press for some of the things they did um, that hurt their business climate, that is making the press. But what's not making the press is all the good things that they did on their tax structure, um, you know, about two or three years before that uh, HB2 came out. So uh, that has been something that has been a, an actual uh, detriment to Virginia. So always looking at what those other, other places are doing. Choose one, which type of tax should be reformed to have the greatest impact on improving Virginia's business climate? 
There is not all of the above. <laughs> Again, I'm trying to drill down and get that focus. I wish I was a horse race announcer. I could be like, and corporate income tax. Because <laughs> sometimes somebody gets out to an early lead and then another one just kind of jumps in there and takes it over. Choosing one, our transportation infrastructure connects products and services to customers in global markets. Where should Virginia concentrate its transportation investments? I know where this one's going. Pretty sure I know where this one's going to come in. So this is a, an example of, it's no different, uh, these, these results have not been any different whether we're, we were in the far south side or southwest Virginia um, than we are in northern Virginia. Everybody wants more roads and buildings. Northern Virginia, you want more roads, uh, more traffic to be uh, diverted. And in south side, in the southwest, they want a road. <laughs> you know, and it's one major road, and it's, it's for their economic development. So there is just a difference in what the roads are going to accomplish. Agree or disagree, exports of goods and services should be a greater focus for economic development in Virginia. Again, not going to give you much time on this one. Kind of hope no one takes D or E. I was waiting for Brendan. To do it. I say he was smirking. I was about to. <laughs> okay, yes or no, have recent or pending regulations slowed your business's plans for growth? <coughs> All right. Choose one, which of these entities has created the greatest regulatory burden for your business or organization? Again, we did not choose an all of the above option, uh, but if you are choosing the other, this is where I'll ask you to go to the vachamber.com, go on the blueprint, tell us who that is, what it was, why it was uh, problematic. Uh, those are the examples that we need to, uh, to try to make ourselves uh, certainly more competitive. Okay. Moving on. Rank in order of importance these areas of concern for your business over the next eight years. Healthcare costs, regulations, legal environment, or the tax code. Again, all are important. Hoping to pick a few to accomplish over the next eight years. <coughs> Trying to get a priority. sustainability a priority for your organization. This is not profit sustainability. This is environmental energy um, consciousness, um, energy sustainability, um, and environmental sustainability. Green roof, on and on and on. And uh, we actually have an energy and sustainability conference, uh, State Chamber does, next week. So this is a topic that has become a priority of most large companies. Choosing one, what is the number one energy concern for your business or membership? Okay. Last ranking question, rank in order of priority. The tools that would be most helpful for your business to encourage hiring veterans as they transition out of the military. Again, all of these are very important and all have been priorities of the chamber and all have been in Blueprint Virginia previously. Um, but we need to figure out what is actually working, what's the priority, where can we be most helpful over the next eight years.
All right. And our final question, again, is not uh, the most difficult question, um, but who should be in charge of offering long-term solutions? Virginia's economic competitiveness. <laughs> Us, or we're just gonna let somebody else do it. Um, and that's really the reason why I was put together. There's always somebody um, that is something. It's always one in the crowd. It, you know, it's a good way to end. But in all seriousness, this is the entire purpose of Blueprint. Uh, for having the business community to have a voice, to have that input. Uh, we have a new governor every four years. Uh, it's unique to Virginia, and I would say it's working well in Virginia, but he also gives uh, the Virginia Chamber and the Chambers of Commerce a unique opportunity to transcend the governors uh, with an economic plan uh, with priorities drawn out from the business community as to what is needed uh, for us to be, again, the most uh, business-friendly state in the country. So with that, thank you for, for your participation, and uh, Barry will wrap it up here. future recommendations for uh, the next incoming governor administration. Uh, we also want to encourage you to go online. We've had hundreds go online to our website and actually type in the, um, here's a screenshot of what it would look like if you went on our website and you can actually click on it and give us uh, longer written answers. This summer, we're going to have individual meetings on these topics. So if you have an interest in one of these topics, we'll spend about a half a day in Richmond. We'll invite you to an industry council meeting. You can tell me or Samantha or Ryan Pierce. Uh, they're up there up out the door. Give them your card. Say, hey, I'm interested in the transportation industry council. I want to come to that meeting. We'll do a deeper dive on transportation, and we'll talk about each of uh, form of transportation and what the specific recommendations are, either for air transportation, surface, rail, uh, and the like. So uh, bridges and highways are always ranked at the very top. The same with each of these. For our Workforce Industry Council, uh, Dr. Rawls here is going to uh, oversee our uh, workforce initiatives and co-chair that uh, along with, uh, we have someone looking at higher education for four-year institutions, a K-12 chair, uh, uh, former Secretary of Education, Jim Dyke. So we have a very talented group of business leaders and education leaders helping us shape our education and workforce initiatives, and thank you for agreeing to do that with us. Um, and I just want to encourage you to get involved in a deeper level in these individual areas. And then lastly, let me close with our timeline. Uh, these meetings are taking place all, all summer, as well as we've had them in the spring. Over 3,000 have participated, like you have today. Uh, we'll have industry council meetings this, this summer. Actually, in August, we'll probably be briefing the candidates for governor, giving them high level um, highlights about what the priorities are, and then making some specific recommendations December 1st as part of Blueprint Virginia, the national rankings uh, studies, the recommendations that uh, Stephen Murray talked about earlier, uh, and a number of other ideas that we put forward as, as your voice of business. Uh, I want to thank the Arlington Chamber, the Falkir Chamber, the Greater Springfield Chamber, the Northern Virginia Chamber, uh, the Mount Vernon Chamber, and obviously Prince William. Thank you for hosting this event, and uh, thank you all for participating in this program today. I'm convinced that working together with our local chambers and business community, we can have our fingerprints on the future of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we'll have a brighter future because we work together. Thank you very much. I saw someone not with a cell phone. I don't know, maybe so he's taking that, that, that uh, <laughs> taking the survey before, but we will uh, quickly wrap everything up. First off, let's give all of our presenters our round of applause. For <laughs> and we especially thank the Inn at Vint Hill for a wonderful lunch. Oh, and yeah. wonderful spread. <laughs> go. I want to thank our cornerstone, and for the sake of time, I wanted to just recognize 
this is our whole list of cornerstone partners and how many folks in here are cornerstone. I just wanted to quickly mention we have Novant Health, UVA Health System, and we have the City of Manassas. Do we have any other cornerstone other than CC Bartholomew Real Estate? <laughs> I'm looking at Kira Nelson, thanking her for being here today as part of the team. And with that being said, I want to, let me just turn the page and just uh, welcome everyone or thank everyone for being here. Thank you for, for participating and we will see you again, drive safe.